Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We just want to give a few minutes as people enter into um, the room. Uh, we want to welcome you to COVID-19 and the Black Community and Mental Health Discussion. So welcome, welcome. Um, so please just give a moment as people enter in the room. Thank you so much. Welcome, welcome. Once again, we're going to get started in a few minutes. We just want to give people an opportunity to enter into the room, into the space. So welcome, welcome. Please mute your phones and your video. Um, it should have been muted upon entry, but just in case, please mute it. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I actually want to start off um, by acknowledging that there's a lot going on right now that is impacting our community. Um, there are a lot of recent events of police brutality um, of people of color, in particular Black people, um, that we have been inundated with in the last day um, via social media or the news. So at this time, I think it would be appropriate for us to take some time um, to acknowledge those that have lost their life and to acknowledge that um, these deaths do impact us, um, whether consciously or unconsciously. And so I want to thank my colleague, Dr. Hargons, for providing me with this list. Um, George Floyd, Brianna Taylor, Amadou Aubrey, and Naya or Nia Pop. Just want to take a moment at this time. So good afternoon again. I am Dr. Kalechi C. Fluid, Director of Outreach at the Howard University Counseling Service. I would like to welcome you all to this roundtable discussion. Today we will tackle the topic COVID-19 and the Black community and specifically focus on access, race, trauma, grief, and coping from a mental health lens. Let me acknowledge that we are in the midst of a global pandemic, one that has impacted our lives in unimaginable ways, and one that we won't know the full impact of for years to come. Today, we have a dynamic group of licensed psychologists that will lead us in this discussion. Dr. Nicole Kamak is the president and CEO of Black Mental Wellness Corporation. Dr. Billy Holcomb is a pediatric neuropsychologist, Neuroscience Institute, LaBrona Children's Hospital, and an assistant professor at the Department of Pediatric, University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Dr. Candace Hargons is Director of Center for Healing Racial Trauma, an assistant professor and director of MS Training Program in Counseling Psychology at the University of Kentucky. Dr. Carlton Green is a Director, Diversity Training and Education. Um, he's Director of Diversity Training and Education in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Maryland College Park. And last but not least, Dr. Sharifa N. Aukta, is an associate professor, counseling psychology doctoral program at Howard University, and the chief executive officer of your neighborhood clinic. To frame this conversation, here is some background data. According to John Hopkins Coronavirus Resource Center, as of today, March or May 27th, in the world there are 5,618,829 cases. In the United States, there has been 1,681,793 cases and 99,993 deaths. 370,000 plus people have recovered. According to the CDC, ethnic minorities have increased risk for contracting COVID-19 because of the following. First, living conditions. They live in densely populated area because of institutional racism in the form of residential housing segregation. They live in homes that are further from medical facilities and stores and multi-generational homes, all of which make social distancing more difficult. Racial and ethnic minority groups are overrepresented 
overrepresented in jails, prisons, and detention centers, which has specific risk due to congregated living, shared food service, and more. Two, work circumstances. They work in jobs where they are critical or essential employees, um, jobs like cashiers, um, caregivers, sanitation workers, farm workers, and public transit employees. They may experience lack of paid leave, which forces individuals to work even when they may be sick. They have, and three, they have underlying health concerns, which lower access to care, and they don't have health insurance, and may face serious underlying medical conditions, such as high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and stigma and systematic inequalities. It is also important to note that some states are controlling for race, making it difficult to get an accurate picture of the impact of COVID-19 on the Black community. However, as of May 20th, Black Americans make up 35% of deaths from COVID-19 in the United States, though they make up a little under 13% of the U.S. population. Let me say that again. Black Americans make up 35% of deaths from the COVID-19 in the U.S., though they make up a little under 13% of the U.S. population. This is what we're dealing with in this global pandemic. To frame this discussion, I have put together some questions that I will ask the panelists and for the conversation to ensue. At the end of the panelists' questions, you, are feel, you can feel free to ask questions in the chat and engage with us in the chat during the entire conversation. So the first question, when we reflect on race and access, what do you think are some barriers to receiving and accessing mental health services in 2020? To, to add to that, I would argue that, you know, one of the things, Dr. Fluid, you mentioned is proximity to medical care. And I argue that mental health care is also a part of a subset of medical care. And so some of the same groups that you speak of also are not in close proximity to uh, mental health providers who can, you know, properly diagnose and treat, um, you know, underlying conditions. I would build on both of those points by saying, even when you do have access to mental health treatment mm -hmm. or to a psychologist, a therapist, a counselor, the overwhelming majority of people who do this work are white. And sometimes you want mm -hmm. a clinician who looks like you. Sometimes you want somebody that is trained not just in cultural competence broadly, but specific aspects of the black experience, even if it's not their lived experience. And that's not the case for most mental health providers. And so you may access treatment and then go into the treatment and then be microaggressed or experience an additional level of trauma just because um, a lack of training and also a lack of representation of Black people in the profession at all of the levels. I would just add to what Candace, uh, Dr. Hargens is saying, like, right, even if you don't get microaggressed, right, there's just the possibility that you don't connect with a person because they don't have any um, tools for being able to understand what it's like to be able to work with a Black person, right? And we, we generally think of ourselves, you know, as a broad group, as, as being sort of like these relational, community-oriented, collectivist right. people. And so we come into, the, to come into the conversation thinking about we rather than I. And many times, you know, therapists will be thinking in terms of the I, and we need to be able to communicate <coughs> with the we, right? Because it's a part of our health. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just even, even if it doesn't feel like something is going, um, uh, something negative doesn't happen, it's also the possibility that something generative doesn't happen mm -hmm. in, if you're in, the, in right. the healthcare setting. And lastly, I think, you know, the colleagues have definitely talked about in terms of the cultural um, obstacles, in terms of the physical um, obstacles in terms of uh, access, but there's also this time piece, right? Like we also know that African Americans are disproportionately in essential workers, even though they are underpaid um, in those jobs. And so there's also this piece regarding time that's required to be able to get mental health treatment even if you do have African-American providers 
or transportation to be able to get there? When do you have the time if you're navigating works, um, a job that doesn't permit you to have access to leave um, and, and the hours to even be able to engage in the therapeutic process? Mm -hmm. Dr. Fluid, can I add one other thing too? Because I, I hear us talking about sort of like these factors that are systemic in nature, so like outside of our communities mm -hmm. that, that affect us. I also think that it's also important for us to be thinking about what are some intra-community um, issues that might be barriers for us, to get, for us to be getting treatment. And one of the things that when I'm out doing trainings with therapists or talking into like the college setting, one of the pieces that I think is really important is that we as black folks can talk about sort of like feeling stressed or feeling not good or, you know, whatever euphemisms that we use. Um, but we don't oftentimes don't have an understanding about exactly like what stress actually means. And stress is sort of like mm -hmm. this, this, this physio, physiological experience that we're having. Um, high, higher cortisol levels in our body that contributes to things like mm -hmm. hypertension or to liver disease or kidney disease or the mm -hmm. deterioration of our bodies. Like high cortisol levels actually um, deplete our immune system and contribute to mental health issues, right? Mm -hmm. And so if we're not talking about these biological processes that are affecting our body's ability to function, that also becomes one of the barriers to seeking treatment because we're not thinking that there is something physically or physiologically happening with our bodies. We just think of like it's this unnamed amorphous thing that's happening out there when in fact something is happening in our bodies that we need to get some treatment for and we don't talk about it that way. And to add to that, I would also say yep. that a lot of times people may not even have the knowledge of what's happening or that is the problem. I think for mm -hmm. a lot of black people, we're taught to endure. So the more you can endure, the more strength you have, you're like looked at as, oh, look how strong that person is. We don't even see it as a problem. And a lot of times we also endure so much or have so many experiences that it's hard to differentiate that, wait, this isn't normal. So a lot of times in treatment, it's a struggle to even educate someone that what you're experiencing is depression, like putting that name to it. So a lot of times by the time black people come to treatment, it's like the symptoms are so much more severe than, you know, other populations that is like, oh, now I'm coming because I can't handle it. And it's like, oh, but that's depression or this is trauma or that's anxiety. And I still get pushback at that point when I'm trying to educate, like, no, I'm just stressed. Okay. <laughs> right. right. I love talking about black people. So, you know, let me just add a little something to that, right? Because yeah. I think that historically, mm -hmm. right, our bodies haven't been our own. Yeah. Right? Other people have... Um, owned our bodies or other people have appropriated our bodies for their own entertainment or for their own enjoyment or for their own um, to make money out of our bodies, right? Um, and so we, in some ways, don't get the opportunity to name sort of like the depression or the anxiety that we're feeling because we've been taught not to go and to understand mm -hmm. and to do communication with our own bodies, right? So we will ignore that. In addition to some of the other reasons that Dr. Kamek was, was explaining, but there's this piece about we don't actually um, have really, oftentimes we don't have good relationships with our bodies to be able to check in with our own bodies to say, mm -hmm. something ain't working here, right? And in some ways we haven't been given permission to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's- wanna, Oh, please, sorry. Please, Dr. Hargon. <laughs> I just wanna name the constructs that we're referencing here. We're talking about John Henryism. So we've all heard the myth of John Henry and that story of how he just worked himself, worked himself to death, basically. And also the strong black woman or superwoman mm -hmm. schema. So we've got black theorists who've talked mm -hmm. about these things and relayed these constructs in in these academic journals. But I want to bring the language to the to all of us so that we can know. Like when I see my husband working, 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 I'm like, babe, you need to rest or you need to lay down. He's like, no, I got to do this for the family. I'm like, okay, John Henry. And then he, <laughs> <laughs> and I, and then he gets it. He's like, all right, you're right, you're right. Or if I go too hard and I'm like, no, I'm going to write this paper and then I'm going to raise the baby like this and do homeschool and all. He's like, okay, superwoman. And I'm right. like, you're right. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and take it. <laughs> <laughs> 
And I think all of that is important. And one of the things that you guys outlined was trauma, right? So this notion of trauma and or um, an individual's inability to be able to name what it is that is that's happening for them in the moment. So when we think about trauma in the Black community, which has been viewed as transgenerational, right? So transgenerational mm -hmm. meaning it's when people pass on their trauma unconsciously via stories or effective messaging. In what ways has trauma been further exacerbated by this global pandemic? Mm -hmm. I think you started this mm -hmm. discussion with some of those mm -hmm. racist traumas or racial traumas that exacerbate the already difficult structural oppressions that we're experiencing that get played out through COVID, but that existed before COVID and served as the, as the mechanism through which we were over impacted by it. So you're seeing people murdered in that being publicized and shared repeatedly on social media. You're watching families grieve. You are walking through the grocery store with a mask on and someone acts as if they're afraid of you. Like you're fearful perhaps of walking through your own neighborhood or going for a jog. Like those, those types of traumas or traumatic stressors create I think we're exacerbate the trauma that we're already experiencing, the grief that people are already experiencing, the sadness that people are already yeah. experiencing. I, to, to add to that, I think, uh, so in the state of New York, New York, we hear you. We hear you, Bill. Sorry. Um, so in, in the state of New York, um, there actually was something in the New York Times about two or three weeks ago that talked about people of color being more likely to be stopped for not wearing masks than people from other groups. And so if we think about things from a historical standpoint in New York in particular with stop and frisk, I think that kind of perpetuates this, you know, uh, negative uh, discourse, negative relationship between people of color and those who are, you know, and trying to, to protect and serve. Mm -hmm. And then I would also say, you know, uh, because COVID has disproportionately impacted not only African Americans, but also our elders, oh, families yeah. are losing their matriarchs, their patriarchs, mm -hmm. um, in a time where we're not able to grieve as we normally would in our collective way. And so that yeah. is extremely traumatic. You know, friends, fathers and mothers, grandmothers and grandfathers have passed during this time um, in a way that feels unnatural to African Americans, you know, to not be able to come mm -hmm. together and have funerals, to not be able to have um, Passovers and, and eat and, and fellowship together. So it's not just even the, the grief of losing someone, but also this grief of not being able to mourn in ways that we that's more natural for us mm -hmm. that has also um been extremely traumatic uh for our community as well and so i would also like to add though and in that i have also seen ways in which our culture has become resilient um in the ways that we are right like it's no wonder to me that DJs are having their, their <laughs> moment because we are people that love to sweat out the problem of the day. You know, it's no wonder that we're having versus battles and connecting with songs of liberations and songs that um, provide us with some form of self-care. And so, yes, we have definitely experienced a lot of trauma that like um, Dr. Anya, uh, Dr. Fluid <laughs> indicated, um, but we've also seen sparks of resilience and, and recovery in ways that I don't want us to, to miss either. Yeah, yeah I, think I would a, add, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, I think that it's important to, to, to even come back to that, the concept of this is about us, right? Um, we figure out how to survive together. Right, it's not just about the I or so like the nuclear family, but thinking about DJ D Nice being online and so like, you know, what a hundred thousand people are tuned in or you know something like that, including the Obamas and you know other folks. Like we are all black people. We are we are a black family yeah. trying to figure out how to get through this together. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think that the the other piece that I would that I want to add before we get to talking about resilience and resistance, right, 
There's also, I think that there is a piece of this, um, the trauma that's occurring, that's not just about being black, it's about being black and woman, right? Knowing that there are ways that women are suffering in, in um, uh, disproportionate ways. It's about being black and trans or being black and queer, right? And having exposure to this virus means mm -hmm. different things for those bodies. Um, it's about being black and poor, mm -hmm. right? And we know that poor people are really, really suffering and worried. There was just an article today in the Washington Post about um, working class people worrying every day, um, whereas people who are making $150,000 a year are not worrying at all. Uh, and so the, just the intersectionalities around being black and some other aspect of our marginalized identities also compounds the experience or compounds the worry or compounds the stress that people are experiencing. And that too is very traumatic for our bodies as we walk around or even as we are walking around in our houses or, or not, even if we don't have a house, right? Mm -hmm. So I, th I think you highlighted that, right? The compounded experience um, of the Black community, of the diaspora that is so vast, right? So whether it's SES or gender or, um, or how people identify in terms of sexuality and things like that, um, being able to understand that our experience is so vast. And so in addition, the way in which COVID is impacting us is also going to be vast. When you all talk about grief, and Dr. Uta mentioned this a little bit when she started talking about the way in which we cope with grief um, and the way in which grief has impacted us. I want to try to talk a little bit more about that. As an extension of trauma, in what other forms have you found that grief and loss has been um, experienced in this global pandemic? Um, and I want to throw it out to you all. I would say the mourning of our social relationships and our social self. Mm -hmm. You know, we, um, like Dr. Green has said, this aspect of being collective and being a we and just needing to speak to someone and say, hey, how you doing? And not feeling like you can't do that because you may contaminate them. Um, just that, I mean, just that small thing, but then the larger things, it's Memorial Day, cooking out, it, holidays have, have occurred and we haven't been able to fellowship. We haven't seen friends, birthdays. My whole crew is turning 40 this year and people, we, I done missed out all my birthday trips. So, um, <laughs> social self um, has been a lot of grief and, and, and mourning around that. I would just throw in like this weekend in Washington, D.C. was supposed to be Black Pride weekend. Mm -hmm. That didn't occur. And I think adding to that, like all of the things that help you feel like yourself or feel connected to people or that may be your outlets, you're not getting it anymore. So you don't have Black Pride Weekend, which may feel for some people, this is the only place or time that I feel accepted. Imagine taking that away from people and speaking to like the 40th birthday uh, parties and celebrations and trips, but also that connection to family. And I think recently I've been thinking a lot about this when you see the crowds, you know, in certain communities where they're still like going out and being together. And it's like, instead of us judging that automatically, maybe part of that is I just need to feel connected. I need some normalcy. I need to be around my people and people are struggling with that. And it's driving Fortunately, I am seeing people come to therapy, um, and a lot of it is speaking to that earlier point about I don't have to drive into work or I'm working from home so I can schedule this telehealth appointment midday without the job knowing. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of people, it's just that grief and loss of like that social connection, like you were saying. Mm -hmm. And I would, um, to Dr. Kamak's point, I, I have been thinking like, you know, I feel that I have failed the community in some way because it was almost as if we should have anticipated that people would need to be celebrating and engaging in appropriate or maybe not so safe <laughs> um, release activities. And, you know, it would have been great for us to think about how can we still socialize and engage in social activities in a way that promotes safety because I mean who wants you know this we human this has been hard for all of us yeah. um and so I can't imagine if I had to go into work every day 
um, in the way that some of our people who were in Southeast it, it's, are probably still having to go into work. And I couldn't also fellowship. I couldn't also eat out or see my friends. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I should have brainstormed a little earlier to say, you know, just leave your, your party, street party to 50 people, you know, <laughs> instead of 200. Um, so to think creatively about that for the people instead of thinking that we were going to become something that we're not, even though this crisis is upon us. Mm -hmm. I've seen that. Creativity. So I've seen people doing graduation ceremonies drive through. And mm -hmm. I know that video had been going around where the young black man was just like, I made it. He's in the car with his mama. I mean, that's a community in your car and the teachers are standing outside social distance. And then he says, F it, you know, I'm getting out of the car to hug my teacher because I don't care in this moment. I still need that physical contact. And sometimes we make that choice and it's a conscious right. choice. It's not something to be judged. It's like in this moment, I'll risk it for that hug because this moment was so meaningful to me. Mm -hmm. I made, I made a similar choice right at the, outset in March where my grandfather passed and I was like okay well I'm gonna be with my grandmother and so I'm gonna drive up and the whole family's going and we'll just deal with whatever we have to but we're gonna be here to grieve and to mm -hmm. to celebrate each other and to eat together and to hug on each other to the best that we can mm -hmm. and then you know we'll social isolate as a family for the next two weeks and I had the privilege mm -hmm. to do that because of the type of job that I have and my brother who works at a grocery store uh, warehouse was like, I got to work 17 hours. But he still was like, I want to spend these couple hours I have up with you because you're here. Like those are the choices black families are making to be with each other, to, to cost themselves some extra sleep or some extra money or perhaps health because we love each other that much. We care about each other that much. And so we've gotten creative doing black family Zoom reunions. And I mean, yeah. when you see... 30 black elders on zoom that's a joy in and of itself mm -hmm. <laughs> trying to watch mm -hmm. everybody mute and unmute so. <laughs> I think the other thing that is really significant for the population that we're talking about is the loss of religious communities or the loss mm -hmm. of connection yeah. with religious communities whether or not it's a church or a mosque or a synagogue or you know whatever it happens to be um, there's something about the spiritual or, or the religious that has been so um, life-giving for Black people through the years, right? And so now we are, we have pivoted, right? You know, that there was that moment that Dr. Alakda was talking about. So like, we just stopped everything, right? Mm -hmm. And church has learned how to pivot and to say, let's do virtual online services or let's figure out how to be virtually connected in fellowship. Um, but we also know that there is nothing replaces being in a sanctuary or being in a synagogue with right. other believers who you are able to have corporate worship with, right? Um, as somebody who sings in a church choir and knowing how, you know, churches and choirs have been portrayed, not portrayed, the, what we're hearing about, so like how the virus has spread in some of those communities as a result of mm -hmm. singing, it is really, um, I mean, like literally to my soul to think about, it may be a while before I can gather back together with other people to sing, is really a tough thing to, 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 to like hold. Um, well, at the same time, knowing that I will live, right, you know, um, but, but, but that's, a, that's also a, a grief that many, many Black people are experiencing. And I think what we talked about or what we've heard is just the, not only the resilience of our community, but the creativity of our community. I've seen mm -hmm. so many viral events, whether it's graduation or proms or parents building um, stages for their children, we have to realize that also in grief and loss is the loss of moments, similar to what you all have been talking about, right? So graduating, we don't know if that's the first in that family to do that, um, graduation, proms, and, and just the last time to be youthful before college or before the next experience, middle school graduations, kindergarten graduations, we don't know. Um, one thing about us that we do know is that we celebrate right? We use opportunities to we celebrate. Are. And so you get all A's in your report card, your family is calling you, you know, and so we found ways to, to connect and be creative, even as we, we try to celebrate these milestones while grieving um, the opportunity of not having it. Um, and so I think that's one thing I want to add. When we talk about the need for connectivity, and when we talk about the need 
for support. And we talk about the John Henry syndrome or the, uh, super, um, the black superwoman, right? So these notions that have been created sometimes by our own community, but sometimes by other communities about us or the impressions that people have of us. I guess for me, I want to kind of pivot into the discussion to talk about when someone finds that they are in need of mental health services, what are some ways now in the midst of this global pandemic that they can be connected? So what are some ways that they can connect to mental health services? I've seen a lot of the people on this panel doing a fantastic job, Dr. Green, Dr. Kamek, Dr. Olive, Dr. Holcomb, with uh, ex expressing the mental health values that we've developed and the knowledge we've developed online. So using social media <laughs> as, a, as a gateway <laughs> to connect with communities, to share events like this, to have yeah. um, talking social hours with people. Uh, you see therapy for, therapy for Black girls. Mm -hmm. She was doing this before there was a uh, need for it through COVID. Like so, and, mm -hmm. and so were you, Dr. Kamek. So it's like those, those type of engagements with the community on the platforms we're already on socializing give a visual to who a potential therapist could be. Like, oh, mm -hmm. that's what you look like out here? Great, I, might wanna, I want, might wanna mess with you. Or you might be able to put me in connection with somebody in my state who will be able to do therapy with me. But we're talking about these constructs. We're talking about depression. We're talking about the mental health experiences in the black community in a way that's much more accessible. So that's how people I think are getting the, that's how people are finding me. I know that for sure. Yeah. I get asked that a, yeah. a lot. Can you help me find a black therapist? I'm like, um, okay. <laughs> I'll help. But one thing that I have in doing those searches for people and trying to figure out, because uh, another thing for a lot of Black people, if it's your first time going to therapy, it's hard. When you look at those search engines, it's overwhelming. There are uh, so many different yeah. types of providers who has expertise in what you're dealing with right now, who might be a possible good fit. And you're doing this based on a description. And so I always frame it to people like, okay, I'll do the search for you um, based on whatever you're experiencing, right? And then I always tell them, it's like an interview is best fit. So the same way they're yeah. coming and they're providing a service, you can go in there and see if that person is a good fit for you. But the other thing I've been thinking about with so many providers doing telehealth right now is that you can also expand the reach within your state. Yeah. So whereas before you were only yeah. searching for providers who may be within a certain distance from your home or job or whatever, you can open up the state now. So if you see someone who's a little further out, if they're a licensed provider in Maryland, they can see you anywhere in Maryland. So yeah. those are things that I've suggested. And in using those search engines, if you want an African-American provider, go to Therapy for Black Girls, or there's one like Therapy for Black Men too. Um, or look on psychology today and sort of narrow your search down who mm -hmm. accepts your insurance, who may have a sliding scale fee um, to expand the options of who your providers could be. Mm -hmm. You, you know, also, one of the things. Uh, no, no, go ahead. I would also add you can also look on the Association of Black Psychologists, Black psychologists uh, for, yes. for listings as well. And if you aren't at the I'm ready to go in someone's office yet, um, I just always suggest that we understand that there are certain things that we know make us healthier all around. So definitely monitor your diet, definitely monitor what you're eating, engage in exercise and also make sure that you are getting enough sleep, okay? You can mm -hmm. also start practicing other basic mental health things, begin to journal, uh, begin to meditate. There are free apps. Um, Dr. Hargens um, actually has a, a meditation um, uh, as well, but you can meditate and you can also journal. Those are just some basic things mm -hmm. that you can engage in that we know improves mental health. Yes, so since we're on the topic of coping mechanisms and how we cope, I mean, it's like this panel is phenomenal, and how we cope during COVID-19 and in this global pandemic, we talked about journaling, we talked about meditations, any other ways that people can cope during this global pandemic? Dancing. I, one of the things I will say, and I don't think we give ourselves enough credit for yes. this, is like we are we're a pretty freaking amazing community. Like we in many situations can make the best of times. And so, you know, we spoke about like the versus battles, and, you know, Jill Scott and Erica Badi, you know, all of those things. And it takes you back to a happier place in life, right? 
Um, one of the other things that I would say, and, and I, I do this even in my, you know, my own life outside of like, you know, family and things like that is our utilization of multiple uh, technology avenues to reach out to others. So even like in my, within my uh, uh, fraternity chapter, we had a conversation, a whole dialogue, eight o'clock this morning today about COVID and about, um, you know, police brutality and you know, 40, you know, plus, you know, people in this space talking about topics that are of interest to us that impact us. And it just, it's been, I know there's been a lot of, 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 of hurt and there's been a lot of grief in, during this pandemic, but I think it's also important for us to recognize that we've been able to tap into things and to discuss things that maybe we weren't doing beforehand, you know? Mm -hmm. I would add on to what Dr. Hulkman is saying. So like the dancing piece sounds really important and I would back, I would like back out from that. What I always tell people is figure out how to move your body. Yeah. Some people mm -hmm. like running or running or yoga or sex or whatever it happens to be. Like you've got to move your body. <laughs> it really helps to regulate the cortisol levels that really contribute Absolutely. to the stress that we're, that we're experiencing. And then the other piece that I would add to like even backing out again from what Dr. Hulk was saying is like, how do we engage with, um, how do we use technology to engage in spaces that will be affirming for us, right? Mm -hmm. So we all have, or many of us have church experiences that we have traditionally mm -hmm. gone to on Sunday morning. Yeah. Now you've got a choice. You can go online and find almost any church that you want to go to, <laughs> right? Um, even if, you know, even if your church doesn't do sort of a black theology or a black affirming theology, you can find somebody right. online who will be doing that for you. And in this particular yeah. moment, we need to be bringing into our homes um, via technology or whatever it happens to be, voices that are affirming our blackness in a way that mm -hmm. builds us up. Yes. This yes. COVID and the murders, everything is so like really working against us to tear down our blackness. Mm -hmm. But we have to be really intentional about building up the blackness, even as um, society is trying to tear it down, even, even while we're in isolation or in quarantine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I would add on to that piece about using technology, but also using the self to create these positive coping things. You know, just challenge yourself to just say one positive thing to yourself and to the people in your home daily. We, you know, science has shown that if you speak positivity to a plant, it grows better and stronger. So we can just do that one thing for ourselves. Just challenge one positive word to yourself and to the people in your home. Also, hug therapy. Hug yes. work. Um, uh, science has also shown that if you hug it saves babies lives it it it, it 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 it's nothing like physical touch so sex yes and hugs everybody else <laughs> yeah yes. speaking of that i don't know if y'all just saw it but my daughter like snuck up on the side and she's like i haven't had a hug in a very long time i just need a hug and so it's one of those things especially like both with ourselves but with your children as well like they are losing yeah. out on that social connection and those physical interactions with their friends and kids are very touchy and yeah. so they need that as well and so as we're thinking about that for what we need think about that for your children too so we have a rule if you ask for a hug i mean she, you're, you're gonna get it but yeah and a good grandma hug a good right you gotta get a good grip on it <laughs> not that little pat on the back right. <laughs> gotta lift up somebody up with it I want to just, first of all, touch and agree with everybody who said sex. So as a sex researcher, yes, because we, we need that healthy dopamine, that physical touch, mm -hmm. that oxytocin, like all of that that can come with sex with yourself or with someone else. So I just want to name that. But also play, play in general. So a lot of mm -hmm. people reference like their children, but adults need play time too. So yeah. kids absolutely need play because they learn through play. So when they're not right. getting the type of structured school environment that they typically had, they can still learn through how you play with them. But also we need to play too. So having family play time or getting online and playing little games with, with, mm -hmm. with a community or with yourself, if you wanna play solitaire or something like that, just time where you're not work, 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 working. I don't know about you guys, but I'm probably overworked right now. And yeah. that's frustrating because, you know, I'm at home all the time and yet I'm working more often. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a reminder to myself, I'm saying it and reminding myself at the same time that I need play time. So yeah. that is going to be helpful for adults and kids. 
Yeah. I want to encourage people to be thinking about Adrian Marie Brown's work around pleasure activism. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, really speaking to the politics of, of what it means to feel good. And at this time, we need to be feeling good, right? Even as sort of like the, the cries for productivity or sort of like the cries mm-hmm. for checking in at work to make sure that you're earning your paycheck or that you mm-hmm. have, you're gainfully employed. Um, right now, actually, as, as a part of our resistance to how COVID-19 is treating us, we need to be thinking about, like Dr. Hargens has said, how do we get some of that oxytocin or some of that dopamine going? And a lot of that is gonna be about engaging in some type of pleasure activism for ourselves. Mm-hmm. I also think it's important to note the importance of getting reputable information from a reputable source. I think we are inundated (laughs) with information, and I think it's almost, it reminds me of the game telephone we would play as kids. By the time it gets to the fifth person or the second person, it's not the right information. So I really want to encourage us as a community to make sure that we're watching the CDC and WHO and people that are reputable, because we can get frustrated when we see nonsensical things on TV yeah. and things that don't make sense, it can cause us further anxiety, even in this and stress that it's unnecessary. So really doing that, really want to harp on the exercise piece and the moving the body. 30 minutes a day, we want to encourage you to get up because even outside of COVID, there are um, some diseases that impact our community more than they impact others. And so being able to infuse a healthy diet, eating fruits and vegetables, we're cooking. I know we're tired of cooking. It's been almost three months. But, you know, (laughs) infusing healthy meals, eating healthy meals, exercising at least 30 minutes a day, meditating, connecting with your religious organizations, all of those things are important um, even as we try to continue to go through this because now the stay-home orders are being lifted, right? Right. But you will have to determine when you feel safe enough to go outside. Mm -hmm. Um, And so while you're in this pandemic, and even as we know it's going to impact us from years to come, please, please, please be safe and take care of yourself. I just really want to encourage you on that. Um, So our last question before we... Can I add something to what you're saying? Actually, this feels really important to be able to highlight, even as you're talking about the work that we're doing inside our homes, right? And we see that the, that the articles and the research that's coming out that is really highlighting that women are losing their jobs or women are not necessarily um, producing uh, professionally at the rate as men are. Yes. I think there's something to be said about calling Black men, especially Black men who live in houses where there are Black feminine people, into this conversation in a way to say it's time for us to be thinking mm-hmm. about our masculinity and about patriarchy, about how some of those rules might actually be um, keeping us from doing something different and punishing Absolutely. the women and feminine people that we live with. Um, yeah. And that's not really what we need either. Like going on the other side of this pandemic, we need to be thinking about what does it mean to be a, a strong black man who's also able to be in touch with our vulnerabilities mm-hmm. to the degree that we are empowering our partners and our partners see us as people that are that 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 they can trust, right, with our vulnerabilities, and then simultaneously, we need the black women people and the black women people to let it be okay for black men to be vulnerable, mm-hmm. because that you know it, it's sort of like this this um, dual thing that's going on, that black men who are expressing vulnerability get punished for that. Mm-hmm. Um, we, got, we really got to figure out this dynamic, and this is a perfect time to be trying to do that. Mm-hmm. Yes. I love that. I love that so much, man. We. We talk about having flexible gender roles, and I'm just thinking about this when we're talking about how we raise kids. This is the opportunity now when you're at home <laughs> to, <Yeah. laughs> to think about masculinities and femininities in the plural sense and how you raise your children to examine what it means to be in a male body or a trans body or a female body and have a spectrum of genders to choose from and to play with and to engage and for your home to be the safe space for you guys to guide that process as opposed to the world and school systems and (laughs) peers like Mm -hmm. imposing and then policing a specific Mm -hmm. type of masculinity born out of white supremacist patriarchy Mm -hmm. and capitalism that Mm -hmm. has never served the black community. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just never served us. And a lot of us have bought into it, men, women, and trans people wholesale because it's the model that gets perpetuated the most. So I really appreciate yeah. you saying that. Yeah, yeah. So I wanna say um, the next question um, is, May is Mental Health Awareness Month, as we know. 
Um, what is your hope for what black mental wellness will look like? My honest answer, okay. yeah, my honest answer, I think something we haven't talked about is a lot of what we know about mental health and wellness is not based on Black people. Mm -hmm. And my yeah. hope is that we can, Black mental wellness will be specific to our people, what yes. it looks like for us, what it takes for us to cope, how we are that community, what are the things that are specific to us, yes. um, and having that freedom and that space, because as we, part of connecting to a provider who looks like you, whether you have that shared experience or not, is sort of having that understanding yeah. of what Black mental health looks like and not having to explain what it's like in, you know, a lot of ways. And so I just yeah. hope that it takes away the stigma. It allows people to feel more comfortable, that um, you can feel more free to mm -hmm. explore your mental health and wellness. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I want to tag into that and definitely say, for me, it is the freedom of bearing the burdens of everyone else's poor mental health. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is no wonder to me that, you know, we're at the, the crux of this and seeing police brutality activated again because people who already may have had poor mental health, it, it's going to run down and we're going to have to bear the burden of that. We're going to have to bear the burden of the poor health system. We're going to have to bear the burden. Bear the burden. So mental wellness for me, for Black people, is the freedom that we don't bear that burden anymore. We yeah. lay that down. We lay that bag down. Yes. We just carry what is ours, yes. which is, you know, feathers. Mm -hmm. we, we like loving people. <laughs> I'm on free stuff. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's my vision. That's my yeah. vision. Yeah. Anyone else? I want an ethic of love in everything we do. Mm. And for me, the wellness piece looks like us giving our most loving, compassionate selves to each other first. Because to your point, when we bear other people's burdens, I think then we exercise that on the people in, in and around us who have less power than we do. But if we give our compassion first to ourselves, mm. to our mm. communities, if we give our respect first to our communities, if we give our love first our honesty and truth and authenticity and vulnerability and joy to ourselves first, I think it enriches our wellness all around physically and mentally. So giving ourselves the good stuff first is a part of wellness for me. So your actual physical self, but then your community as a self, as a collective self. So us enjoying each other, loving on each other, being compassionate and graceful with each other, all of that looks like wellness to me. Yes. Yes. I would add that I think that it is about redefining Blackness as mm. something that is good mm. and rejecting mm. anything that says that Blackness is bad, right? Mm. Um, because it, it's, it's really related to the things that Dr. Harkins and Dr. Alka mm. were sharing, right? Because we get so caught up in the ways that white supremacy has defined Blackness yes. in very unhealthy ways, yes. right? But if we can begin to speak to our own health, and our own joy and really take control of defining blackness and allowing for a multiplicity of, of, of ways of being black in that, right? Um, mm -hmm. And in, in fact, we will be setting each other free. We'll be setting, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and in some ways, we'll be setting other people free to be able to go do it <laughs> well, right? because we won't be bearing their stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So really to be thinking about what does it mean to be a nerd and be black? What does it mean to be mm -hmm. middle class and be black? What does it mean mm -hmm. to be a Christian and be black? Or, you know, mm -hmm. all, all of those pieces, like let's, let's really be able to mm -hmm. re redefine blackness in, in a holistic way, in an accepting way. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that just really, it almost is very reminiscent of what Dr. Oka said. It just made me feel lighter, right? So the notion that we can just be well and not have to worry about the burdens of others' decisions on us to impact us um, and all the many ways that we want to be well and all the ways that we're seeking to be well. And so um, I'm just really excited about the opportunity to be able to be well as a community. Um, and the hope that we hold for our community in, in its own wellness. 
Um, I'm very mindful of the time. And so at this time, I want to give a couple of minutes or a minute or so if someone has an audience question that they may want to pose. Um, I would like to invite the panelists to please, um, if they have their organizations that they want to highlight, to please put those names in the chat for everyone to see so that people can follow you on social media. Um, like it, once again, this is sponsored by the Howard University Counseling Service. Um, we are a historically black college um, who have been serving people from the di diaspora for hundreds of years. And um, say that we again. felt that this say that again. <laughs> we felt obviously we have a lot of alums, but we felt like this conversation needed to happen. And even though we're a university counseling service, um, we felt that this needed to occur. Um, so let me look at the chat. And once again, if you want to write down your organization so that people can contact you, that would be great. Um, and if you all want to look at the chat, if you want to connect with any of the um, people on this panel. Okay. Dr. Fluor, our chat just, I think we can only chat with Send you. It to you. Okay. So sorry about that. Let me check the group chat. Everyone in the meeting. Okay. Okay. All right. All right, so thank you for telling me that. Let me see if I can just um, send this to everyone. Okay, so I don't have any questions coming in, but what I am doing now is um, pasting or writing information that I received from the panelists. Um, some of these things were, um, someone said that they feel encouraged, um, that this is excellent, it made them feel lighter. Another person said this is a superb discussion, information that needs to be highlighted more. Um, there's some people visiting us from Toronto, Canada, um, and wanted to acknowledge that they are from Toronto, Canada. Um, another person said, speak in all exclamation marks. This has been absolutely amazing. Um, and so I am putting this information, so I ask that you bear with me, um, even as I put it in the chat for everyone to see. Um, can I can I say yes, this as well please. while you're doing that? Um, yes, of course. One of the things that I that I hope we get from this experience is openness with acceptance. Mm -hmm. So openness in a sense that we can share the vulnerable parts of ourselves with a with a uh, with a mental health professional or a close family member or friend, with the expectation that they will accept what we say and and help us help navigate what that future or what that course will look like for us. Yes. Yes. Anyone else? Any any um, community conversation? I I saw the um, Rihanna video again and missed everything that's happening when she encouraged people of other communities to pull up, mm -hmm. to come mm -hmm. and fight alongside of us, mm -hmm. to be supportive of us, to to be in the discourse, to be in the posting, to be in the protest, and to be involved. Um, so whether we're talking about police brutality or we're talking about the way in which African Americans have been disproportionately um, impacted by this disease, it's important for us as a community to remember that we are the world. We're all interconnected one way or the other. Um, and so that's really important. Someone said, is, the, is, it's, um, is, black th is there Black therapy for young ladies? Of course. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. I think Dr. K. Mack or Dr. Utha, which one of you were talking about? Um, the black therapy for girls. Yeah. For black girls, okay. Yeah. Therapy. Okay. For, but I would also um, to encourage people that are here. You know, we talked a lot about the system of the family and the individual, but also back when we begin to re-enter our offices, our workspace. Um, I didn't, Amy Cooper in New York, you know, the Twitter, y'all so great with y'all research skills. You know, they can found that she's a liberal, right? Like they said that she's a Democrat, you know? And so a lot of times we work in spaces and we work with people who consider themselves to be good people. But we have to also go to our jobs, go to our offices and say, if we're not doing implicit bias training, if we're not doing training regarding mm -hmm. microaggressions, then we're mm -hmm. not actually doing some of the work that we can and should be doing and mm -hmm. understanding how race is really impacting ourselves on an individual level and um, in, a, in a macro level in our work environment. And so take this back to your family, take it also back to your workplace and encourage them to impact that system as well. Yes. I would add to that what uh, just said about, um, so like I do consultation for uh, organizations, whether or not they're like universities or counseling centers 
or other types of settings. The thing that I always try to bring to those settings is not only just talking about things like microaggressions and racism, but to talk explicitly about white supremacy culture mm -hmm, and about mm -hmm. how that is actually one of the major barriers to people mm -hmm. being able to experience their mm -hmm. settings as welcoming or inviting or mm -hmm. um, something that's going to nourish who they are as individuals. Mm -hmm. It's actually white supremacy right. culture that is devaluing not only Black people, but it doesn't do much for white people either. Mm -hmm. It does not. Mm -hmm. It does not. Dr. Hargons, as you know, um, in the midst of this um, global pandemic, we're all multitasking. So people are still seeing clients. You know, she had a client at one o'clock and so she had to exit. Um, and we're going to go ahead and conclude. At this time, I just want to um, thank my director, um, who is also in this chat, um, Dr. Michael Barnes for the opportunity to even have this event and for supporting this event that, that I really have, was really so passionate about. I wanna thank our panelists, Dr. Auta, Hargons, K-Mac, Holcomb and Green for their expertise. Um, I would like to thank you all for tuning in and joining us in, the, in this discussion. And I wanna encourage you to keep the dialogue going. On a final note, we did record um, this dialogue, and once it's ready, we will publish it on our YouTube page, Howard University Counseling Service. We're also on Instagram, HU Counseling Service, um, as well as on Twitter, HU Counseling. And so I just really want to thank you all for joining at this time. Um, you have my contact information if you need to reach out to the Howard University Counseling Service, but I want to give... I want everyone to give them a round of applause, even wherever you are in your spaces. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, want to read final comments. Um, someone said clapping. It said, thank you so much. This was uplifting and affirming to hear as a Black doctoral student. It felt good to see my people sharing this topic and our truth. Someone said, uh, please consider a continuation of this dialogue weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, covering various <laughs> topics that impact people of color. So know that people want to hear you talk anymore. Someone else, uh, thank you so much for this information. The work is hard, but rewarding. And I hope the panel members are taking care of themselves. And I want to echo yeah. that also. Um, another person, thank you for this amazing event. As an HBCU alum and a counseling psychology grad student, I was happy to see this event and dialogue. Um, my boss said thank you all clapping and shouting um, someone else said so needed current HU students and they are current HU student and this was a revival for them god bless um, this was amazing thank you for the opportunity we're from Canada we just want you all to know we support you all down here too um, so this has reached across and it's really because of you panelists it's because of your work and what people know that you do and so i'm open to having more dialogue with you even amidst this pandemic so we'll get together and see how we can further this conversation thank you all so much we had 140 people register for this event plus and um my heart is grateful thank you all so much thank, thank you. you thank you bye, -bye.